When you were my age, did you ever have trouble deciding what you wanted to do with your life? <laughs> no, I never had that problem, really. Why? Forget it. I didn't think you'd understand. Back to Growing Up Punk, the podcast about punk rock and all of its friends. We've got a very special episode for you today. Aaron's going to be sitting down with Steve Kravak. Now, Steve has produced and engineered some of uh, probably the most, uh, some of the most influential albums for Aaron and myself, for sure, and maybe you as well. I mean, if you're clicking on this simply because you saw Steve's name, then yeah, 100%. They're going to talk about, uh, you know, a number of those classic albums that Steve worked on, including, you know, the MXPX projects, the Cooties, as well as the Supertones, Slick Shoes, even some Less Than Jake in there, uh, all sorts of great stuff. So before we get into that, though, just thought I'd say, hey, go follow us uh, on all of our social medias, Instagram and Twitter, at Growing Punk Pod. You can find us on Facebook as well. We've got Growing Punk dot. Uh, growingpunkpod.com is our website uh, and we're on YouTube as well you can find our episodes on YouTube but we've also got vlogs and stuff going on there as well so we're not going to waste any more time this is an a fantastic interview talking about some legendary albums it's Aaron and it's Steve Kravak well thanks so much for uh for taking the time to be here today Steve this is a, a dream come true for me to get to talk to someone who had you know, such a big part in, in so many influential albums, not only in my life, but in, in many people's lives. So I really appreciate you taking the time to be here. It's great to be here. Thanks so much for having me on the show. Yeah, awesome. So let's just kind of get right into it. I'm not going to um, necessarily kind of get into, you know, how you got into music and podcasting. There's, uh, for those <laughs> that maybe aren't familiar, uh, you did um, a really cool podcast on the Magnified Pod podcast where you kind of you know, go through more of your music history and journey. And so I figure, you know, if... Yeah, yeah, that was actually a really uh, cool spot with the guys, you know? Yeah, yeah. And so... And, 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 and we kind of went down the rabbit hole a bit here and there, but it was a great conversation. Yeah, yeah. So if you, if you want to hear that part of Steve's journey, then please go check out Magnified Pod. And uh, you can hear kind of from where he came from and how he got to where he is now. Um, but for time's sake, we'll just kind of uh, kind of get right into it. So um, for those who don't know, what's the difference between an engineer and a producer? So some of the albums we're okay. going to be touching on um, today are ones you produced and some you engineered. And so I just thought maybe it'd be good to kind of clarify for people to understand kind of what, what does that mean? Yeah. Um, well, I think that there was a time when those two roles had sort of more of a separate definition, but, uh, you know, with the Reaganomics of music, we're, we're forced to do, we're, we're forced to downsize and do every, be a one-stop shop as it were. Yeah. Um, when I first started out, there was definitely, you know, more of a separation between the engineer role and the producer role. The producer was basically, um, overseeing, um, you know, sort of acting as a musical director and overseeing uh, the part of the process that dealt more with arranging the songs um, and kind of working with the mechanics of, of, of songwriting, while the engineer was working with the mechanics of getting sound from instruments to tape. Hmm. And um, the engineer's role sort of has melded with the producer's role over the years to the point where if you're, you know, if you're, if you're working anywhere above, uh, sorry, anywhere below a level, you're working with a producer engineer, one who does both. Right. And we're now, you know, in a, the, the way the interest, the, the industry is organized, <clears throat> it's really only at the top echelons that you have, um, uh, labor being broken down on sessions like, uh, you know, producers, engineers, second engineers, runners, et cetera, et cetera. Um, when it comes down to making records on a day-to-day -day basis, like most of us do, um, at this point, if folks are getting, uh, or have a, a producer relationship, they're working with somebody that's doing uh, both the engineering and the production. It's just the economics of it, really. Yeah. No, that's And so you've got to wear these days, you've got to wear a lot more hats than you used to. And you've got to have a little bit more knowledge about the process than you used to. 
Um, I don't think that's necessarily a bad thing. And I, and I do like uh, a cohesiveness between engineering and, and, and production. Um, in fact, I think that before I was really um, an engineer, I was more of a producer, like looking at soundscaping and focusing how to, to uh, uh, shape sound or, or, or place it. Um, and it wasn't till a little bit later than I, you know, that I, that I got started in recording that my engineering skills strengthened to the level where that became part of, uh, the toolkit, like in a, in a broader way, if, if that makes sense. Yeah. Yeah. I always kind of thought it was, um, you know, like the producer was almost, you know, in lots of cases, kind of a, um, added member of the band, kind of, they were kind of overseeing the overall thing where the engineer was more, you know, like setting up, getting sounds, like the actual recording and, and doing the computer work and stuff. Um, but yeah, like you said, this, lots of that's kind of been melded together. And I guess, depending on your, your budget and studio and all that, you know, lots of times now it's just kind of the same person doing that. I, I think the fifth member analogy uh, actually works really, really well. And for that month and a half or two months that you're working with you with the band, yeah, you are that fifth member. <laughs> you're expected to show up for band practice on time <laughs> and be ready and remember the arrangements and work every day to kind of tweak and wrench until it gets to a spot where everybody feels comfortable and knows that, okay, we can put our foot forward with this and, and we know that we're making the right step. Yeah. And I, th um, I think the biggest thing is having that extra set of ears that's hearing, you know, as an outside person, but really invested into the project. So it's not like you're just hearing it and be like, I don't like this, or I do like this, but well, how, how can we change this so that it's going to benefit the overall project? Oh, for sure. And I think that even like, you know, in, in if I think back, like I think m maybe even at the time when I was just engineering, only engineering or only producing or, or when, f when engineers had sort of a more separate, uh, uh, kind of part in the process that engineers would probably even be making suggestions then, you know, and it might not have to do with the arrangement, but Oh, like, yeah, Hey, things are sounding good or, or melding good together when you guys are on that part right there. Mm, yeah. You know, it's sounding good in here. Like, and so uh, a good writer or a good arranger can just extrapolate from input like that yeah. and go, oh, yeah, something cool is going on here. Maybe we need to use that part again later in the song, or maybe we need to expand that, or maybe we need to voice things like that somewhere else in the song, mm. you know? Yeah. Um, just being in a situation where you're um, in a highly creative uh, uh, environment with folks that are... Um, really wanting to bring it, mm. <laughs> you know, like that really want to make a record, really want to make a statement. Like that's when you're in good, rich territory and yeah, not every idea is going to be taken. Not everything is a great idea when it gets blurted out at the moment, but cooler heads prevail. And generally speaking, you end up finding the right way to put things together at, at, at the end. Mm. And this, um, the, the songs sort of have a way of providing a map to you. And if you're kind of following the song, most of the time you, you get there. Yeah. Well, what gets you most excited about working with a band or working on a specific project? Oh, gosh. Um, that's a multi-leveled question. <laughs> uh, I think on so many levels, and I think on so many levels, that's why doing this work is fascinating to me. Um, from the beginnings of just like looking at st song structure and arrangements and kind of figuring out how things are going to get presented to tweaking sounds and coming up with a scenario, how to track things so that you get the right energy going, mm. um, to drilling down into tones for certain parts later on as you're overdubbing or to work on lyrics so that they kind of come out and flow, whether that means changing one word in a or cutting one word from a line or changing a word because it just sounds better, you know, right. coming out of your mouth uh, to the point of, okay, now we've got all this stuff on a tape machine and we've got to make it come through these two tiny speakers and sound really big. Yeah. <laughs> like there's so many choices that get, get, have to get made. Like sometimes in a day, a hundred choices, 200, 300 choices, decisions have to be made. And I sort of like the, uh, the ham factor, you know, like when we're making breakfast, we say the chicken makes a contribution, but the pig is committed. Yeah. <laughs> and, and, and I like that idea. I like the idea that 
all of these things are going on and that decisions have to be made and some of them aren't going to be right and some of them you're going to have to live with. But part of producing, it's the word produce. Like at the end of the day, you have got a budget to stick to and your clients are expecting you to stick to that budget and turn in a project that has relevance yeah. and sounds great for what they've, for whatever the budget they've got, right? Like it doesn't even come down to that. It's not about that, right? It's uh, it's about all these decisions that get made to make it all happen. And, and I think that's why this job, you know, 30 years into it, uh, um, still resonates with me and I can't walk away from it. You know, yeah, um, that's awesome. music's a weird, music's a weird thing right now, right? Things are changing. Spotify is the, is the, is the, is the funnel, right? But there's no money coming back. Right. So, so then how do you continue to have a career in music? Well, in my instance, you do a bunch of things, right? You, you produce and you engineer, you have a label, you, uh, write your own music. You, you, you know, you, you find ways to survive as the business is changing and it's changing so rapidly. We can almost not keep up with it. Yeah, and I, I'm sure there's a lot of, I mean, you're kind of a, a special case in that, you know, you have a record label and you release albums and you're a solo artist, whereas a lot of, you know, producers, like, maybe all they do is just is just produce. Maybe they don't have those other outlets. And so, I mean, that definitely works to your yeah. favor to have all those other outlets. I think, I, I think just in a sustainability model, it does. Yeah. Um, and... and in the, in the respect that everybody's got a laptop, right? So everybody's now a record producer and most folks are doing most of their stuff in their own homes by themselves, right? Yeah, that's true. Like we've got, we, we, this isn't 78 or 79 where we were just kind of trying to figure it out. Like kids these days by 13 or 14 are virtuosos on instruments. Their parents are starting them when they're six or seven. They've got great instruments to play with when they're youngsters, right. you know? I can remember my first punk rock band and uh, we had all our gear laying in a room somewhere and somebody came by to visit or say something. He said, looked at the guitar and he says, I just, I can't even believe you're playing that and trying to get a sound out of it, you know, like, but that's what it was when we were kids. <laughs> yeah, It really was. We were struggling. Um, you know, over the last, you know, 20 years, parents have been so supportive of kids. And this has to do with uh, education in schools, too, because music is being pulled out of schools. So folks who are players who picked up a little piano when they were kids, they're bringing instruments into the home and they're teaching children a little bit in the home. And this is a great thing, right? Like, it's a good familial thing. It's a good music thing. It's a good social thing. Yeah. Uh, you know, but... Um, it's great to see the industry where it is today and the freedom that the laptop and, uh, and, uh, programs like, you know, just some of the consumer format programs that I don't work in and I don't know <laughs> that right. everybody uses. Uh, um, I can't even name one off the top of my Cubase, you know, right. stuff like yeah, that. Yeah. Right. Yeah. You know, probably dating myself with Cubase, but whatever. Um, just, just the fact that everybody can kind of jump in and get their feet wet right now. Yeah. It's, it's a great thing. You know, when I was a kid, it was, okay, put four guys in your band together. Everybody's got to save money for four months, and then we can book two days in a studio for the weekend and record, you know, a half a dozen songs kind of thing. Yeah. Now everybody can do it on their phone, pretty much. It's not a 24-track, right? But they can do it on their phone. <laughs> yeah, it's crazy. How was, you know. <laughs> and so, yeah, and, and so, you know, just get, getting back to where we were coming from on this, like the idea that, because technology has changed everything so much, um, the way we look at the business and the way we perform as artists or producers or, you know, musicians in this business, it's got to change. Hmm. You know, we got to, we got to start thinking about doing things differently. And, um, I think that's positive too, uh, in the sense that I think that that's empowering to artists. It's empowering to bands who've got to make their decisions because, you used to be able to throw a demo out to uh, some labels and maybe a couple of people would write you back, you know, and you might be able to start a conversation. You might not get signed, but you might start a conversation now. <laughs> good luck. Yeah. There's so many mice at the door. There's so much content. There's, uh, you know, you really kind of have to just strike out on your own. I feel like these days and go step by step. Mm. W without naming any bands, has it, has it ever come across, um, for you, like where, 
where a project comes your way that maybe you're not super excited on, but you're willing to do, and then by the end, you're completely sold on the band? Oh, it's happened, it's happened a myriad of times uh, in my career as, as a producer, as an engineer. Um, part of that is coming to know the people as humans and as artists. And then part of that is usually once you've sort of established a bit of trust is them allowing you in to go, guys, you know what? We should try this here and we should do this here. And, and if you can provide a couple of concrete examples, well, you know, sort of like this, you can get people to buy mm. into it. I usually find that those experiences like are, they're sort of a bridge where the band comes in coming, thinking one thing, maybe the producer comes in thinking another thing. Right. And by the time you're at the end of the road, you've got something that neither of you guys had anticipated, neither of the two parties that has, has anticipated, but it's way better than what you both started out with in your minds, you know? Yeah, it's it's a very weird uh, dynamic, you know, because the band's coming in with, yeah, like you said, with one thing and maybe a producer, you know, depending on the relationship, another. And both, you know, both want the same result. They want a really good end product, but there's a lot of different parts that play into getting to that end goal. And so how do you as a producer, you know, work through some of those, you know, those ups and downs of, of trying to figure all that out? You stick with the song. <laughs> You stick with the song. You stick with the reason why you're there. Mm, yeah. And you try and let the song dictate the uh, the conversation. And you have a conversation around that song to the point where you come to a greater understanding of, of it and you're able to move it forward. Mm. Does that make sense? Yeah. Yeah. Because, I mean, at the end of the day, that's, what, that's what's going to stand out as a song, right? People aren't... Nobody's going to hear, I mean, you might hear stories of, you know, the band did get along or didn't get along with the producer, but what's going to last is, is the song and the, is the end product. And so it's just such an interesting oh. dynamic of, you know, of clashing ideas and, you know, the band's been with these songs, you know, for, for months and maybe a producer is just mm -hmm. hearing them kind of for the first time, but, um, yeah. yeah. So, oh yeah, yeah, yeah. There's sort of like a cartoon mem about that where like this person's on stage with a guitar and. And um, the person saying, these songs are my children. <laughs> and there's like one guy sitting in the audience and he's saying, your children suck. <laughs> <laughs> you know, and, and it, that's sort of like part of it, right? Right. When you get used to an idea or sold an idea and you, you listen to it over and over again, you kind of convince yourself this is okay. And then in the, the harsh light of day, stuff just evaporates. And this is a lesson that I learned you know, when I moved to the States and started doing a lot of production out of LA and I started taking meetings with A&R people at major labels and going in as a producer going, hire me for, you know, X record or, or Y record or Z record. Oh, well, what have you got? Well, here's my demo reel. And I put together like a, you know, a, you know, a five to eight minute demo reel. And then I'd go into these meetings and I'd see how A&R people treated like listening to a demo. Hmm. And like 10 seconds, 15 seconds. Like that's what a major label A&R person listens to a song for. Right. Okay. And if it doesn't happen in the 10 to, for 10 to 15 seconds, boom, they're on to the next one. Yeah. And I'd start listening to the, some of the stuff that I was turning in for, you know, for on work reels to encourage more work. And, and I go, this sounds good. And I'm, I like how this goes together. And then I'd present it in a meeting and I'd listen to it in the cold light of day in front of an a &R person. I'd go, oh, yeah, you left too much of that in there. That when they got to that second verse, that gear shift wasn't there mm. that you needed. You'd start to listen to stuff with, uh, with a, a, a scalpel. Right. All right. Well, then you got to come back to the studio and turn around to the band you're working with and go, you know why things haven't gotten to that stage? It's because X, Y, Z. Like it's your, it's sort of your job to be the translator. Right. You know, yep. Bands want, bands, bands want to be successful. Yep. Bands want to make, earn a living, not make, they want to earn a living playing their music. They want to earn a living sharing their ideas and their thoughts. Right. Yeah. So if you can't, if you can't get them to the finish line, if you can't get them to where the guys on the 57th floor can listen to it and go, yeah, that works well, then you're not doing the entire job. Mm. <laughs> and I think that's one of the things I was gifted with the most in getting the opportunities to work with some, 
some pretty pretty talented bands and some some of the major labels and some of the major independent labels was to take those meetings yeah and to see how people in the business really thought about what it is right like you're down there hanging out with a band in the studio oh it's all cool guys we're hanging out think oh sounds great man sounds great okay that's cool well it's cool until you've got to turn it in right yeah <laughs> and then the a and r person says well i don't like this or the label says well that's not good enough or you're turning it in to try and shop this to somebody that works for rca and has been in a and r for 15 years and knows the business and you're trying to walk into their office and sell them on something and go, uh, hey, I think you should listen to this band. And I'll tell you what, the, the blinders come off. Yeah. And you, you learn a lot more about arrangement. You learn a lot more about how that first chorus needs to hit. It's the thing I'll say about, you know, Tim from, from Rancid. He'll get it in five times. He'll get that chorus in five times. You know why? Because he'll start the song with the chorus mm. right off the bat. Can we get two of the chorus? Boom. Okay, then to the verse. Then let's go right back to the chorus. Let's hit a verse. Let's do a, a, a C part. Let's hit the chorus three times on the way out. Boom, boom, boom. We've just done it. Figured out how to do it five times. Okay? Most bands I've worked with, like they've got two cor they've got two courses in their arrangement, and they're trying to figure out why it doesn't work. Well, guys, we need that third chorus, right? We need to nail it. We need to bring it home. Yeah. But a guy like Tim, he figured it out when he was a teenager and knew how to do it. You think it's an accident that Tim Armstrong is an accomplished writer and has been signed to a major independent label all his life and has his own imprint and produces records for other like incredibly talented people? Yeah, for sure. Like, come on, man. Like, and I've worked with Tim on sessions, right? I've, uh, I've, assisted, I've assisted on his sessions. I've jammed with him in studio. I've had lunch with the guy. I've, you know, talked about a myriad of things with him, you know? And he's, 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 he is a gifted, gifted man, you know? But he gets the rules of the road and he doesn't try and break them too much. Yeah. You know? Yeah, that's awesome. Hmm. So speaking of labels, you know, you've... We're going to kind of move into uh, touching on some of the the records here. So you did a lot, produced a lot of bands for Tooth and Nail. And so how did your relationship with Tooth and Nail kind of go over the years? And what was the first band that they sent your way? Uh, first band was Value Pack. And they sent me Value Pack uh, not to me. They sent Value Pack to West Beach Recorders, uh, which was uh, at the time a studio on Hollywood Boulevard owned by Brett Gurowitz, who heads Epitaph, yeah. and uh, and a really talented engineer by the name of Donald Cameron, who a lot of folks might know from Propagandy. And, right. Uh, uh, and, um, you know, that Scream, Scream Dracula Scream record that he did for, uh, um, uh, what's the San Diego band? Rocket from the Crypt. Oh, yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah, Don's done some incredible, incredible records. Mm. Um, and so they had sent, uh, Tooth and Nail had sent Value Pack over to, uh, to West Beach because they were getting good sounds there. I had just kind of come in and started engineering there and, uh, band was booked. I got a call from Brandon Ebel, who was the head of the label, said, yeah, I'd like to put these guys in. We're going to book a week and, uh, I'd like to send you a deposit, blah, blah, blah. No problem. Uh, we booked the session, got the guys in there, and the record turned out about a gazillion times better than the band or the label could have hoped for. Yeah, was that the late, was that the album Jalapeno? Uh, no, I believe it was before. Oh, was there a self-titled the one? It. it might have been the self-titled oh, okay. one. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, and so um, that worked real well with Tooth and Nail you know, who were still a very young label at the time, right? Yeah. Ninety four. Yeah. The label had only been a going concern at that point for, I believe, only a year or two. Yeah, that sounds okay, right. Okay, so, 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 so that was kind of a first, and they really liked the way it turned out. And then they hit me up, if I recall correctly, about a couple of other acts, um, and I did a couple of things for them. And then um, they had asked me to come up to Seattle to work on a band called the Cooties. Yes. And I didn't really know much about the Cooties, except that I knew that there were some folks from MXPX in the band. 
And I had known about MXPX because uh, I had assembled a comp at West Beach for uh, an indie label and MXPX was on it. I believe Punk Rock, Punk Rock, Punk Rock Show was the song on it. Okay. And so I, I, had, I had assembled this comp- compilation uh, you know, one of those like 30 punk rock bands on one oh, yeah. CD kind of thing. Those CDs we were, were my life I, back then. Oh, dude, 94, <laughs> 95, 96, 97, 98. Like that's all everybody listened to. Yeah. Epitaph was doing the Punkarama series, yeah. right? They'd, they'd bang one out every six months and, and they'd do it like, they'd do them for like five ninety nine. Oh yeah. Right? The CDs, four ninety nine, something like that, which is really cool. Really, really cool. Um, and so I... I become aware of uh, MXPX through assembling that compilation. And then uh, Brandon said, well, come up and work with the cooties um, because we're going to do something for them. And so I came up and they had booked a room up in Seattle and I stayed up there for maybe about a week. And I believe we did about four or five days of sessioning to do that cooties record. Um, And that's when I met uh, Mike and Tom. Uh, from MXPX and sort of helped them work through that project. And then the next thing I knew, uh, Brandon called me up and he said, well, we really like how the, uh, the cooties thing went and MX has this record in the can for this thing they're, that they're calling life in general, but we don't think it's the record. Mm, yeah. And, and they're like, we're kind of vibing on the energy you brought to the cooties. What do you think about, potentially working with these guys and taking a second look at this life in general thing because we feel like we have some songs but we don't think we're there and so that's really how the the meat end of the stick started with tooth and nail was getting that life in general record going and then moving on with them to work on a few of their other sort of more accomplished acts like OC Supertones, who I ended up, you know, getting nominated for a Dove Award for that right, record. Yep. And, and, um, and and just a, just a bunch of Goaty Hook, right? Like just a bunch of great, um, cool bands that were super creative and trying to make the best records they could. And, and of course, at the time, like there was a record industry and we were selling records so you could put out a record and sell some and get in there for a second record. Like, you know, that things hadn't really completely gone all to heck at that point. Right. Yeah. Well, let's let's get into some of these. That's a good segue because uh, Life in General is the, the first album on my list here. So so this is my all time favorite album um, of all time, and, and I know it's many other people's, and I love that story behind this album, you know, how they kind of already had a version of it, and they weren't really happy with it, and uh, yes, yeah, so they connected with you, and, and that album still stands up, you know, after 25 years, so how does that make you feel, knowing that you, you had such an impact on how this record turned out and, and its longevity? To be honest with you, sometimes it's kind of overwhelming. Um, I recall it's about two years ago. Um, uh, Rolling Stone published uh, a top fifty pop punk records of all time yeah, I know that list. list, and the record made that list. Yep. And I hadn't been in Rolling Stone for much in my life. <laughs> okay, so that was kind of a jaw dropper. It really was. Um, the same time I've always have been in love with that record. Like it was the record that we as a band and I'm including myself as the fifth Beatle in that, uh, or the fourth Beatle as it were, but it was the, ba- it was the record that the band that we as a band needed to make at that time. Yeah. I needed that record as a producer, as a showcase for what I'd been working up to for the last 15 years. And, you know, or 10 years, 12 years. MXPX needed that record to break out of um, being a band that had spent three records, supporting three records in church basements. Right. And moving to a national stage. Yeah. And becoming uh, a real band. Mike still thanks me. He says, thank you so much for showing us how to be a a band. Yeah, that's such a good compliment. <laughs> Which is, it's, it's a nice, it's a really nice compliment, but 
and I know what he means. Like I had, I had come through the war before that, you know, up in Canada and dealing with some of the bands I'd been dealing with and seeing how it was done right and seeing how it was done wrong. Mm. And so everything that I was trying to instill upon those guys as we were working through that month of making that record was to do things the right way. Yeah. And I can remember one day Brandon called down to the studio and everybody was passing the phone around and talking to Brandon and Tom was beside me. We were kind of cutting some guitar tracks and he said to Brandon on the phone, he says, don't worry, we're making it perfect. We're making everything perfect. Mm. And that's when I knew that we were on the right path yeah. when Tom said that because he had the confidence to see that we had made the change and overcome whatever it was that, or, or I was helping them overcome whatever issues they had. And then those issues are none of my business. Okay. Whether it was somebody they worked with or whether it was overcoming their own issues of confidence, self-confidence and learning their own instruments. Yep. You know, if you understand what I'm saying. Oh yeah. So, so, so I understood it in that moment. Okay. We're on the right path. Go with it, go with it, go with it. And I just kept going down that path until it was done. And, you know, I told this story at a MXPX show a couple of years ago in Ventura this about doing the vocals with Mike for Chick Magnet on the last day. And he's got to fly to the airport or I've got to, I've got to get him to the airport because he's flying out that day. Mm. And, and we're somehow struggling to get these vocals. He's got no voice left and we're just pouring honey down his throat to like code it right. so we can get the last <laughs> couple of lines out and like the last couple of lines are done and we look at one another and like oh my gosh like we've just done it okay get your stuff get in the car we're driving to the airport right now wow. like that's how tracking for that record ended at the last second i tracked that record and i took every second i could have until the very last second until i had to go to the parking lot and drive mike to the airport yeah man that's crazy and that and that's why I look back at that record and why I still love it. It still sounds fresh. It still sounds um, engaged. It still sounds inviting. It still sounds like it hasn't lost any of the energy, Yeah, you know? Oh, man. And I'm really proud of that because I'll tell you what, there's a bunch of records from the era just before me or records that I grew up on and I listen to them now and they don't hold up yeah. records that I was a fan of, you know, and I'm not going to name names. It doesn't matter. Right. That's yeah, not, yeah. that's not, that's not important. Right. But, but that record holds up. And that record was the springboard to a major label deal for that band, yep. right? Like within within 16 months, we went from church basements to a major label. Yeah. Okay. Mm. So we did something right. Something happened. And sometimes I can't even put my finger on it, you know, but it is what it is. And I'll, I'll just leave it at that. Yeah. Well, how was that starting kind of from scratch with them? Like, were they discouraged about having to, you know, redo the whole thing or were they just excited to, you know, have a second chance oh, to no, redeem no. the songs? I don't, I don't, I don't, I don't think they were discouraged. Uh, I think they were encouraged from what they learned. Mm. But I just mean and coming think, in, you know, after, I don't know how long they spent, you know, doing the yeah, first yeah, version. Yeah, no, I get it. I like, get oh, it. we got to do it. that again and. No, I get it. I get it. I think though a change of venue was in order coming to Hollywood and tracking at West Beach. Like I think that put a big spark in everybody. I think the guys were ready to get out of the backyard and make a ready in, make a record in the big city. I think that, that, that um, I think that Mike had written the songs that were ready to go to that level, you know? Yeah. So, so, so maybe laying that first, version of that out was was also an instrumental part of the path in that record success mm. right maybe maybe it's not a failure right right maybe it maybe it's the biggest lesson that they needed to learn meanwhile i'd been over on the other side learning some hard lessons myself and when the two came together maybe maybe that's why that record is so special yeah yeah you know well i remember uh, they put out a vhs called um was it Welcome to Bremerton or something? And and uh, and I, I'll always remember like you know, they did doing some different band interviews and and uh, they were just talking about how you would just kick their ass so hard in the studio and how that had just you know <laughs> completely changed the way like you said that what they were used to and um, so I mean you kind of answered the question already about how you kind of find that balance of knowing what a band needs you know they just they knew they needed to get to the next level you wanted to kind of you know, showcase your talent as well. And so it was just kind of that, that perfect timing. It was a perfect storm for sure. 
and you can hear it when you put the record on. You can hear it, uh, what is it, 24 years later or something like that? Uh, it came out in 96, right? So 96, 2016, yeah, 20, yeah 24, 25 years. <laughs> Yeah. So you can still hear, you can still hear the energy in it 25 years later. There's not, that's not every record turns out like that. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> they, they don't Yeah. You know? as much and as much as you will it to, sometimes they just don't, mm. you know? Yeah. So you take the, you take the, you take the successes where you can, you accept the failures when you can, you learn from both. There's, you can learn from failure. You can learn from, from success, you know? Yeah, definitely. Awesome. Well, I'm gonna we're gonna move to uh, their their follow up album, "Slowly Going in the Way of the Buffalo." So I can still mm -hmm. remember hearing this album for the first time and just being blown away. The production is so crisp and clean on this record, and to me, it has a very distinct sound to it. So, how do you decide kind of how an album is gonna sound? I know that's maybe kind of a weird question. You probably just I'm gonna make it sound the best <laughs> I can, right? But is there? Do you have? You know, especially when you work with a band the second time, you know, you already know what the first record you did sounds like. Yeah, Do you try yeah, to, yeah, like, yeah. <laughs> change it a bit? Or is it just kind of the natural skill that you've learned in between records that makes it sound that way? No, I think Buffalo is a record where we all wanted not to make the same record again. Yeah. And we realized we were going to be in deep doo-doo if we did. Um, we went to another place. We tracked it in Seattle. We mixed in another room on a different console. Um, I think if I could have anything back on that record, I'd push Mike's vocals up a little. Um, I think in the end, we really wanted the record to rock hard. Yeah. And so the vocals are a little tucked so that the band really slams. But at the same time, the band sounds super rich on that record. Oh, so good. Man, I never get tired there's, of listening to that one. There's, It's pretty easy on the ears. Like, that record is sort of like, that's a combination of, like, a lot of API and a lot of Neve. So that was tracked at Robert Lang in Seattle on an API, and that's, like, the old school, like, American uh, console. And then it was mixed on a Neve at A&M, and... I almost think it might have been better to mix it because we started with the API. I almost think it might have sounded a little harder and a little more banging if we had mixed it on the on the uh, SSL. Oh, okay. But but we mixed it on the Neve and the Neve does the Neve thing, and it's super creamy and it's super glossy and it's it never sounds harsh and that's what that record sounds like. It sounds glossy. It sounds never harsh. It sounds like a major label record. Yeah. You know. Um. There's a couple of things I would change. Like I said, maybe I'd bump Mike's vocals up just a little. Um, I'd bump my backing vocals up a little. Ha ha ha. But those songs, I wouldn't change anything about any of them. Yeah. What do you remember about hearing those songs for the first time after? Like, had that you. Mo that, yeah, yeah, yeah. That, that mostly everything was in place. I thought that. And I thought, when I heard the songs, I thought, good work, Mike. You've kind of moved the, the goalposts, but you haven't moved them too far. Right. Like, we're not getting away from our core sound that we just established, but we're ready to come up with a tune that will play on FM radio in North America. Right. Which we did. Which we did. I'm okay. You're okay. Um, was a hit. Right. And push that record. That's that single push that record to gold. Yeah. Yeah. Which is amazing. And that song wasn't even in the running. <laughs> yeah. So well, how did that come about then? Well, that song had already been tracked on that cooties right. record. And so they just thought, Hey, maybe that would be a good fit on this one. And yeah, well, our, our A&R, um, associate um larry weintraub who worked at a&m and who signed the band felt that i'm okay you're okay had a lot of merit mm. and he said you know listen guys i think you've got the shape of a great record here but do me a solid and when you're in there would you please bang out a version an mxpx version of i'm okay you're okay and uh don't hold back yeah which is and i did exactly as larry told me to do yeah and um once we had it tracked and we had the initial mixes done of the record, he uh, we were mixing it 
at A&M Studios in Hollywood, which meant that Larry's office was on the lot, which meant that I could take a meeting with him anytime I wanted to. Mm. And that was also instrumental in how that record turned out, was having our A&R guy right there with us. And, um, and so I went over to Larry's office. He called me into his office one day, says, let's talk about these mixes. And, and he brought up a couple things and I saw, thought exactly what he was saying had a lot of merit. And I went back and I made some adjustments. And then we had another meeting and he said, let's talk about I'm okay, you're okay. And so we sat down and we chatted and he says, Steve, I say, he says, I think this is the one. Mm. Um, I think this is the one that I can get everybody in our, at the label to support. And I think this is the one that the band will support and you'll support. What do you say? Can we make this happen? And I said, what do you need? And he, and he said, I want get back down there, bang out a couple more mixes. He gave me a couple suggestions. I probably banged out maybe five or six more mixes of it and turned them into him. And he chose one of those, which ended up being the final mix yeah. on the LP. And it was the mix that they went to radio. That's the mix they, that's the mix they went to K rock with. Yeah. And it's, yeah. it's so, so Larry was a big part of that process. Um, so glad that that worked out that way. Um, I like that mix off the record. I like how it sounds on the radio. Yeah. Um, it sounds pop punk, but it doesn't sound like the records of its day. It doesn't sound like Dookie, you know, I think it sounds cleaner and more polished than Dookie. Right. I think it's more, I just think it's more radio, man. I yeah. just think it's, I think it's more radio. Which is so interesting because the Cooties record, I can't imagine they were thinking of writing songs to go on the radio with that record. And so that's so interesting that, you know, the, the bigger song off of Slowly Going the Way the Buffalo was a song from an album that, you know, they, that well, probably wasn't even on their mind at the time. No, no. But but we had a great A&R man who, who sat down and listened to Mike's body of work. Yeah. Well, that's and realized, wait a minute, guys. Wait a minute, guys. I think we, we kind of <laughs> missed one here. Can we go back and take a look at this? Yeah. And really, to be honest with you, without that decision, I don't know that that record does what it does. Yeah. And I don't know what ha and I don't know what happens after that. Mm. So when they were in the studio for this album, was there still, you know, controversy between Tooth and Nail and them at this point? Like, did that affect their time in the studio at all? Or no, no, not at all, not at all. In fact, it was a co-op deal between Tooth and Nail. Tooth and Nail continued to. Uh, hold options contractually with the band so that they tooth and nail was able to negotiate a good deal for themselves. And, uh, you know, at the same time, let the band move on to another opportunity. Yeah. Um, you know, when, when there's more hands in the pot, well, it is what it is, Right. but you don't get to A&M without tooth and nail. Yeah. That's very true. Right. Yeah. So, so it's not like I think myself or the band or anybody you know, misunderstood that. Um, I think we're well aware of the fact that, uh, you know, at that band, at that point, the band was uh, like a 10 year overnight success. Right. Yeah. <laughs> you know, if that, if that to, to make that joke, you know, right. Yeah. Well, there, there's a much vaster variety of songs on this album versus life in general. You know, you've got kind of straight up punk songs, more pop influence songs, some that are definitely more, you know, almost hardcore influenced, as a producer, do you kind of tackle each song the same or like separately and kind of how does that look? No, no, they're completely separate. They're all completely separate. Um, a song is like your friend, like a new friend you meet, you know? Like, hey, Derek, nice to meet you. <laughs> uh, and then you work with Derek and you figure out Derek. <laughs> Right. Yeah. Then you move. Then you then you move on to the next one. You know. Yeah. And that's part of the reason, also, I think, why Buffalo works was like I was saying earlier, like Mike kept the thread, but he opened the scope. And if he was going to open the scope, well, then I was going to go down the rabbit hole, and I was going to mine that for everything that I could get out mm -hmm. of it. So if he's giving me like sort of a, a like a like a six eight tempo. Um, and it's funny cause there's six, eight tempos on one song on life in general. And there is one on, uh, Buffalo, but if he's going to give me a six, eight tempo, then I'm going to work with that. And I'm going to turn that into a waltzy kind of flowery, 
um, presentation, you know, but if he's going to give me, um, you know, like an instrumental, uh, like, uh, the instrumental on Buffalo, uh, then I'm going to take that to the wall and make it as nasty and weird as that can be. Yeah. You know? Um, yeah, you're going to have, an, uh, yeah, some of your tones are, you know, across the record are going to be there. The drums are going to probably, you know, sound kind of the same. I mean, that's who I am. Like, I'm not the guy that goes in and like sticks a guitar stomp box on the drums. Like, but, um, yeah, I'd approach every song differently. Every song gives you the roadmap and says, I need this, I need that. And they all need something different. Mm. And, 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 and on that Buffalo record, like, I think they're, the reason why there's the, the reason why the scope in the writing gets held together is because the production kind of treats it all equally. Right. You know, you never get, it doesn't get you too far up it's a punk rock record, man. It's a punk rock record. Like we're not making a Pink Floyd record. Right. But you can, you, you, you can get out there, but there's a point where you got to kind of rein it in too and go, you know, we've got 37, 38 minutes to get all this in. So let's stick to our guns. Yeah. Well, I think that's why so many, you know, attain this this record to be MXPX's, you know, best work because like you said, like there's there's a bigger scope of the songs, but it's a cohesive piece of work. You know, each song stands at its own, but all together, you know, it, it fits so well, even though, you know, there might be kind of a popular song and then, you know, you have a song like the theme fiasco that's just kind of a bit wild and right. crazy and instrumental, but right. it just it works for some reason. So Yeah, yeah, ab absolutely. Yeah, that must be, you know, again, a, a good feeling as a producer, knowing you were able to, you know, help a band. You know, you already helped them step it up with life in general. Now they're stepping it up even more and just having, um, you know, a more vast variety of song and songwritings and opportunities. And, um, yeah, that's yeah, awesome. Yeah, definitely, 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 you know. And I think working on that second record, too, you know, Mike and I had a closer relationship because we'd worked intensely on the vocals on life in general. And... So in that respect, I think we'd built trust. And I, I think that on, on Buffalo, whenever I needed something, I could ask Mike and he'd go, yeah, yeah, yeah. And whenever Mike needed something, he'd ask me to go, yeah, 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 yeah. Mm -hmm. Like we'd, we'd support each other because we knew, hey, we've done this before. We know how to get to the finish line. Let's just get there. Yeah. Was, you know? was there ever a talk of working with the band again after this album? Um, not, no, uh, I did work with them or work with their, uh, uh, masters. I did a let it happen record, which was like 32 songs of B sides and demos, um, uh, that uh, tooth and nail approached me and said, can you make something out of this? Yeah. So what was your role um, in that? Just kind of trying to make it a bit more cohesive and kind of, you know, cause there's, there's recordings from all over the place on that album. Oh God. Yeah. Well, let's see on that, on that record, I engineer, I produce, um, I sing, <laughs> I play guitar. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So how did the, some of those come together? Like they just needed some parts to finish the songs and uh, basically like the majority of the stuff we had, had two guitar tracks on it, but there was a few songs that only had one. Okay. And they wanted something that was going to be cohesive. Tooth and nail wanted something that was going to be held, held, held together. Yeah. So I just jumped in and, you know, doubled you know, existing parts on a couple of songs to push them up. And anywhere that I thought there was a backup vocal or a harmony missing, I'd just throw it down. Oh, okay. Which is, that's the same on life in general. And it's the same on, uh, on uh, Buffalo. If you hear a second voice there, that's me. Oh, okay. Oh, that's um, awesome. That's because at, at, at that point, uh, Tom and Yuri hadn't stepped up in front of the microphone. So, you know, on those earlier records, anywhere you hear a second voice, I'm, I'm backing Mike. Yeah. Right, that's um, really cool. As you know, and I, and I, our voices sound good together, which is why I ended up getting him <laughs> to sing backups on my record. Yeah. No, that's amazing. <laughs> was there for life in general in Buffalo, was there B sides um, from those records that were either released later or. I don't believe so. I think we did everything that we had on the table. I know that on, um, Life in general on the song Doing Time, which is a great song. Oh, so Mike good. had written yeah, Mike had written that and it clocked in at oh like a minute and thirty seconds or something yeah. like or a minute and forty seconds. One. 
And then um, Tooth and Nail came back to me later and they were like, can, people like this song. Like we're thinking about it as a third single. Um, can you do something with it? And so I listened to it and I listened to it. I was like, yeah, I can use the bridge twice because the bridge is really good. Yeah. <laughs> so, I, so I did an edit of it with two bridges and I sent it back to Tooth and Nail. <laughs> And um, I think they might have used it. I don't know that it ever went to be like a third single, like pushed it radio, but they might have used it for a B side somewhere or something, you know. Oh, but okay. but really, like really, like we were not focused on um, also rands. We were focused on what we had at the time, right? And it wasn't like oh, I've got a couple of other ideas that we could throw down. It was like no, we're going to put everything in to what we have right now on the table. Okay, they have a and that. That was my attitude. I have a song of theirs. I think it's called "Good Friends Are Hard to Find," and it sounds like the drums, especially, sound so similar to the drums on Buffalo. So that's why I was wondering if, um, if it was from that session or, or if that was even mm. a song you had done or not. No, I uh, maybe a demo from those sessions or something. Okay, yeah, possibly, but I, I honestly. Aaron, I don't have a recollection uh, of that. Yeah, I, do, no, I don't have a recollection. No, that's fair. It, it's an awesome song. I was just listening to it last week, and so I was really curious as to kind of where some of these songs come from. But yeah, any other right. any other thoughts about uh, working with MXPX before we uh, move on? Oh, just just uh, just an incredible opportunity for me, um, and um, and I'm just so grateful and so thankful that um, Mike and Yuri and Tom continue to be in my life you know, 24, 25 years later, yep. that we continue to be friends, that we continue to be relevant to each other and that we continue to care and love for one, one another. And that's my greatest thanks yeah. for, for, for that relationship. I know, that's awesome. Well, we're going to move now to um, to Slick Shoes on some of their older albums. So I recently had uh, Jeremiah and Jackson on the podcast and it was only... Oh, amazing. It was only then that I realized that you had produced their album Rusty. Um, I guess I just had never picked up on that before. Um, what, what do you remember about working on this album? Oh, uh, probably that Ryan was one of the youngest singers that I'd ever worked with at the time. Yeah. And he was all, also, he was also one of the most amazing singers I'd ever worked with at the time. Yeah. What was that like? Kind of having like a kid in the studio he, almost. Well, he was all 14 years old, yeah, that's right? That's crazy. And had already started a, started, you know, Jackson had started a family. <laughs> that's right. Um, uh, working with uh, the Slick Shoes was one of those tooth and nail projects that came along early on. And that uh, that Rusty EP um, was something that they brought in and was pretty much a developed idea. Right. They kind of knew where they were, they were going with it. And um, I was super excited to just meet the guys and hang out with them just because everything, everybody was super cool and mellow and like at that point I had been doing sessions in Hollywood for, I don't know, maybe about a year. And boy, some of them were pretty weird. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so I was pretty excited when like folks came in that were like focused and had, you know, their ideas together and were like, okay, we're ready to do this when they started showing up. And that's what making a slick shoes record was like. It was like working with people who were organized. Oh, that's, that's a, a compliment to them. Cause I mean, they were still a pretty young band back then. So. Yeah, but they got it. They sort of got it. You know, uh, uh, Jackson, I think had been listening to a lot of other people's records and, and just woodshedding, trying to figure out what his relationship with the guitar was all about. And Ryan, um, you know, they probably growing up in choir, uh, had learned that, well, there's something working here, you know, and it, Joe even early on was a terrific drummer. Yeah. Oh, well, for sure. Uh, you know, and, and, and we taught Jeremiah how to be a great bass player. Yeah. You know, we taught him the basics, move to down picking, you know, get this kind of, get this kind of a tone, play this here. Like he's an incredible bass player. Like, dude, the stuff he plays on the new records, insane. Yeah. Yeah. We'll, we'll get to that a bit later. We don't want to give, oh, give sorry, any more details. Sorry, sorry. <laughs> sorry. No, that, no, that's all good. Yeah. Well, this is, this is actually the album that like changed my life. So this and life in general, but with this one, I discovered this, I wasn't really into punk yet, but it's what I, you know, it's what I wanted without knowing what it was. So when I came across this, put it in, it was a demo tape in a store and just that first song was like, okay, hey, this is what I've been looking for. I just didn't know what it was. 
And, right. Uh, it's, you know, same as life in general. This is an album that I can still put on at any time. And I mean, there's a lot of nostalgia connected to this one. So, um, you know, whether it's the sound of it or just, you know, so many years of memories with it, but it's, it's always going to stick with me. You know, I, and I, and we all have those records, right? We all have those records that were the ones that kicked it off for us, you know? And for me, as a kid, it was probably like listening to DOA for the first time, mm. right? Or, yeah. the, or the Dead Kennedys or the Clash of the Pistols, you know? Yeah. And um, and so I get it, right? Like, And I think that's why I ended up doing what I do is because of that moment when you listen to that record for the first time and it makes that connection and there's nothing else that feels like it. I think that's why I ended up in music. <laughs> mm. Yeah, that's so cool. So thank you for reminding me of that. <laughs> yeah, yeah. A question about Jackson um, on this one. How were you able to to work with him to bring out the best on his guitar, especially since he was the only guitar player in this band? And his guitar style is very unique. You know, it's not just power chords. You know, there's no, a lot no, more kind no. of lead parts. And so what was that like working with him on that album? Oh, it was uh, it was really fun. It was really fun because even as a young man, he had a good command of the instrument and a good un understanding of, of the instrument, like he had been working on it for a while. And so that's that's great because when a guy's got confidence with his instrument, then you can suggest, well, what about this here? Or, hey, try this here. Um, and guys don't even bat an eyelash. You're like, oh yeah, I could try that, mm. you know? Um, and so I think... Part of that experience was just kind of letting him go because he would jump between rhythm and lead, like rhythm and single notes, yeah. you know, or octave and single note and octave and rhythm and octave to single back to, you know, he'd mix it up. And so there's so much going on that you just kind of got to sit there and take it in at first. Like the first couple of passes as the guy's laying his parts, you're just kind of taking it in. Right. Because, because, the, because what he's doing is highly technical, right? Oh man. Like it's not so uh, good. It's, and it's, and it requires a lot of focus. And so you're trying to, you're trying to support that focus. And at the same time, trying to see where there's opportunities to stretch it even further. Mm, yeah. That's awesome. And my recollections, my recollections from, from, from that session, from that rusty session was just, we were working fast. We didn't have a lot of budget or a lot of time. I think for the most part, those songs were arranged, were tracked sort of as they were arranged. We might have made a couple of changes, quick changes off the floor, like start this way or end this way or something. But I don't think we really got into the meat of the arrangements. I think the songs are pretty much the songs as the band walked them in, yeah. if, I recall oh, correct, cool. if I recall correctly. Yeah. Do you remember what the budget was for this record? Oh, gosh. What would have been back then? <sighs> Let me think about that for a 10, second. I'm going to say maybe or? no, no, no. It was an EP. It was a four-song EP. I'm going to say the. I'm, I'm going to say a thousand bucks a song. It was probably about four thousand bucks to make that. Sorry, are you are you talking about like the, like the the first EP that they did or the the full yeah, length the, the, Rusty? Uh, well, no, Rusty the EP, the four-song EP. Okay, is that, I thought that one was self-titled, and then the full length is well. I know the full length is Rusty. Well, they might have repackaged it later, but Rusty was an EP when I did it, and then uh, Burnout uh, was the full full length. Okay, yeah. So then you you recorded there, you know, a highly anticipated record, Burnout. So this record sees the band adding a second guitarist, taking on a a darker, moodier undertone to their writing and a much more polished sound. On your part, what were you hoping to achieve with this record, working with them that second time? Because there wasn't even really you know, that much time in between those records. No, there wasn't. There wasn't. And so I'm thinking a lot of those songs were probably had to be written around the same time. Um, uh, I think that we were trying to raise the bar again. Like we were trying to go from where we were to next level. Yeah. Um, I don't know that on all levels we got there. Um, I still listen to that record sometimes and I'm like, eh... I'm not talking about the band, but I'm just sort of talking about how the mix sits. Yeah. I think the snare, the snare could have been in a better place. Gets a little boxy at times. Oh, the snare is such a good snap on that record. I lo I'm a drummer they, myself, they, they, and they, I love they, the sound uh, of the drums on that record. There, well, there you go, right? That's, so it's just me, you know? Um, but um, the thing I like about that energy, the, that record is the energy of it. Yeah. And it's up. 
Yeah. It is really, it is really up. Yeah, I love that. How, um, so how do you... I think also, too, that I uh, think when I was was doing that, like, that record, we, we were definitely looking for a more professional outcome. Yeah. Like, we, we, I know we wanted to raise the bar, and I know Tooth and Nail were saying, well, you know, we'd marketed an EP in the past, but now we're taking these guys next level. So I, I felt like everybody sort of felt pressure on that record. Mm. And did that, you know, did that work together or was that, you know, did that add extra stress or do you think that added to a, a better overall outcome? Just feeling that pressure. I don't, and... I, 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 like, I, don't, I don't think it, I don't think it hurt it. I think the, uh, I think it's an urgent record. Yeah. Y you know, like I, I, songs have gallop to them and the, and the, and the bound, the band sounds like they have something to tell you. Mm. Um, I don't know. That one for me, I just, I, maybe I just want to remix it. <laughs> yeah. Well, maybe you can I do a 25 year uh, remix or whatever it's coming yeah, up I on should next. Call, but... I, yeah. I, I, I should call up, Bra I should call up Brandon and see if he's got the masters. Yeah. How do you find the difference between working with a band for the first time and the second time? So whether that's, you know, I mean, you do that with MXPX as well. And now with Slick Shoes, is there, you know, a, yeah. a higher comfort level? Are you able to maybe push the band a bit more or does it cause, you know, different challenges? Oh, no, definitely. No, no, no. I, I think definitely. I think there's more of a relationship built in. So you're able to ask a little bit more and push a little bit more. Mm -hmm. Although I'm pretty, I'm, I'm pretty pushy um, because I know what I like, but yeah, on that second record, there's definitely more of a, a rapport. And you've got to, you've got something to build off of. And so that's a double-edged sword. You know, you, you've got what you've done, but what you've done is in the past. And so now you've got to do more and do better and move forward. Right. And so there's comfort, but there's urgency at the same time. There's a, there's a drive at the same time. Yeah. No, well, that's, that's a good way to, to explain that record. Yeah. So the next one I have is uh, blink One Eighty Two is Cheshire Cat. So you engineered this one. Is that correct? So what happened there was the band was sent up to, to me at, uh, at West Beach from Cargo Records in San Diego. And they were sent in for three days to do a 17-song record. Wow. And so <laughs> no we got pressure. in. And no pressure. Great guys. Loved them. Um, and so we got in there and started laying this stuff down. And within a few hours, I could see there's no way we're coming out of this weekend with 17 songs mixed, ready for a record. And so I talked to the guys and I said, look, is there a way we could, you know, I know Eric who owns cargo, you know, I can call him up and ask him, you know, would he give us a day or two more? Cause we can really hit this out of the park. And for some reason, even after I told them that I knew Eric, they didn't want me to talk to him, which is really still to this day, very odd. Yeah. Um, and so what I did was basically, I just tried to hustle through the weekend, do the best I could to track everything and get it on tape for them. And then um, do mixes. I mixed on the Sunday. I mixed 17 songs in one day. Wow. Just dump, 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 dump. And turned it in and knew immediately upon handing it to guys that this isn't going to work and the label is going to reject it. I already knew that they were going to reject the sessions. Uh, be before they were turned in, I knew they would be mm. rejected. And so the guys went back to San Diego. Sure enough, the uh, cargo uh, listened to them and rejected them. And, um, but, and, uh, although Eric knew I was, Eric Goodis knew I was in California, knew as I was working at West Beach, he didn't reach out to talk to me about it. So there's this sort of odd, um, um, kind of cloud that st still sort of hangs over that yeah. production. Well, that's too bad. Um, because I wanted to do such, so much more for those guys. Cause I really liked them. And I realized within five minutes that Hoppus was a great songwriter. Yeah. I even told, I even told him, Hey, there's one of these songs on, um, I said, I'm putting a band together. It's one of these songs that we're recording. Is it okay if I cover it? Cause it's really good. Like, I, like I knew like immediately the guys had great songs and great ideas. I just thought there was so much more we could do with it. Yeah. And, uh, it didn't happen. Sent the masters back to San Diego. They grabbed a couple of local guys, this guy, O from San Diego who I've met and is a terrific guy, a complete gentleman. And he jumped in, did some more overdubs and got a mix together so they could get the record out. Oh, okay. And that's so, so that's really how that record happened. And I'd never heard another thing about it until I was driving down Melrose Boulevard one day with a buddy in his convertible. 
we had the top down and this car pulls up beside us and I can hear the song blaring out of this car next to us. And I'm like, I recognize that song. Oh, wasn't that song the song that I told Mark Hoppus that I would cover because it was so good? <laughs> oh, that was awesome. And then I like, we're like, hey, we yell over to the car. I'm like, what are you listening to? And um, the girl in the car goes, it's Blink. We love it. And my friend points at me and goes, my friend recorded that record. <laughs> oh, yeah. That's so cool. <laughs> Too funny. Yeah. So maybe it's a, a dumb yeah. question to ask, but like, had you hoped that they would you know, potentially come back to work with you again or – was it just kind of, that was it? Oh, I think that's it. And I think that's the way it works in the business. People don't go back. They go forward. Yeah. Well, I mean, you know, yeah. uh, that's just it. It's like, you're always striving for something new. You're always moving on to something else. Uh, the days of the seventies and the early eighties when a producer would make three or four or five records with a band are gone. Right. Uh, attention spans are so short that you have to completely mix everything up and make it sound like it sounded, but not like it sounded. Yeah. And so that's why they're looking for folks, new folks every day to do what you did. Plus they can pay them half for pennies on the dollar right. for what other folks did. So yeah. that's the way the business works. It's sad, but that's the way it is. Yeah. Well, at least, I mean, it's still cool. You had your hand and, you know, Ben, that's become so successful, even if it was in a smaller way years and years ago, but just to have that on your resume. I mean, that's, that's a, that's a really cool. Oh, for sure. I mean, I had three days, I had three days and I did everything I could to get that out the door and, and make it a success for the guys. And part of that worked and it was a success for them yep. and moved them on. And so in that respect, I look back on that and I go, Hey, we did everything we could to move them along. Yeah. Yeah. That's awesome. Well, the next band I got is uh, less than Jake. So you worked on their borders and boundaries album. Uh, this was the follow up to their, their successful hello rock view, which was the first album that I heard of theirs. So how did you come about to, to work with them? And what was that experience like? Well, the way I'd come to work with Less Than Jake was actually on that Rockview record. Uh, that was produced by Howard Benson. Right. And um, Howard needed an engineer. And so the Less Than Jake guys gave him a short list of, I don't know, maybe three or four guys. And I was on that list. Oh, right on. And so Howard asked me to take a meeting with him, said he needed an engineer to go out to Florida and uh, work for a couple of months with this band. Uh, less than Jake. And I was like, Oh, I've, you know, I've heard of those guys. I didn't know too much about them. Losing streak had kind of just broken. Right. And it was on Capitol. So it was getting a little attention. Craig Aronson was A&R on that. He's, he's passed away. Sadly, great A&R guy, a big, big, big supporter of less than Jake, really big supporter. Actually, when he moved over to Warner brothers, uh, later on in his career, he took less than Jake with him and signed them on to Warner Brothers. So Craig Aronson, uh, rest in peace, has all, always had less than Jake front and center and made some great decisions that helped that band in, yeah. in a big way. That's really cool. You know? But uh, yeah, it was Benson that asked me out to come out and do that record after the interview. Uh, it went over good and uh, he felt like I could make a contribution and uh, went out to Florida and basically I handled... Um, drums and guitars and Howard handled vocals and bass mm. as I recall. And, uh, we pieced it all together, sent it to, uh, out to LA and had Chris Lord Algae mix it. And that's how that relationship started. So when they needed to do their next record, uh, borders and boundaries, they rang me up and said, well, how about covering both sides and producing and engineering? We think you can deal with it. And, and so we jumped in and, it was a tough record to make, mm. but I, I go back and I listen to it now and I go, uh, that's the record we needed to make. Yeah. Why, why you was know? it tough? Uh, because it was a hell of a lot of hard work mm. and getting, uh, you know, seven guys in a band, all of a sudden it's not four guys. It's seven right. guys. Yeah, three, of are, three, of the, three of them are three of the, three of them are three, three of them are playing horns. Two of them are trombones. Trombones have no reeds and have no keys. Right, it's just a big slide flute yeah, yeah, it's a with a with one. a horn on the end of it. I mean, it's 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 sort of like taking a bunch of stuff and just throwing it into a blender and going, well, what are we going to get? And it was it was sort of about trying to take all the the the, the that energy and hone it into a record and, and a couple of singles that capital 
could take to radio. Um, the Rockview record had been successful at radio. Yeah, there were some really it got, good songs. It, 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 got, it got ads. It's not a great sounding record, but it got ads. And, um, you know, good songs, good melodies, right? Yeah. You know, this is what, 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 Vinny and, what Vinny and Roger and Chris are known for, you know, have always been known for. And Buddy just writing the greatest horn lines <laughs> ever that you could imagine for a band like that. Yeah, and that's one thing I love about them is sometimes in, in that genre of music, at least for me, the horns can sometimes get a little bit too much, but they know how to just to balance them right where they're, you know, I don't know if it's whether they're high pitched or just yeah, the melodies that they do with them just really complements the song instead of just being thrown in there because they have to be or whatever. No, for sure. I mean, you know, the band probably came in thinking, okay, we're moving on to our next record and it's got horns on it. And I'm thinking, well, I'm on, moving on to my next record and it's got horns on it. And I want the horns to sound like Chicago, so, you know, which is the greatest horn section of all time. Yeah. You know, you know, so, so I'm trying to get to that level, right? I'm trying to figure out how do we get there? You know? Yeah. Well, and yeah, so succeeded with that's, that. That's, 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 that is, that's, that's sort of like tough. Like it's easy, it's easy to make records. Anybody can make records, you know, but it's hard to make records that when you've just worked with a band and now you're moving on to their next record and you've got to step it up Yeah. and you've got to figure out how do we do this? Like, uh, how do we, how do we do this? It takes every tool in your box to pull out and go wrench on that wrench on this. Got to go farther. Got to go deeper. How many hours did we work today? Well, we worked 16 hours today. How many did we work yesterday? We worked 14. We might have to work 18 tomorrow. But if that's what it takes, that's what it takes. Yeah, yeah there's definitely a lot you of know? dynamics that play into that for sure. And I mean, I just, I just remember that record being long hours, like really focusing on parts, really focusing on the lyrics, really focusing on the melodies, really focusing on the vocal performances. I can remember Chris, like reading an interview with Chris and he said, the record that I learned to sing on was Borders and Boundaries when I worked with Steve. Yeah. Steve taught me how to sing. Right on, good job. You know, well, he wasn't very thankful when it was going down. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's, you yeah. know, we were, we were, we were probably, we were probably having a few heated discussions together yeah. about how it was going to go down. But, but, that's how it went down and that's the record we made yeah well and like we were saying before i mean there's always lots of those dynamics that happen in the studio but that's not what people are going to remember now they're going to listen to the songs you know even the guys themselves you know they'll think like oh yeah that was a hard record to make but now look at this product that we have that we're happy with and that's what's going to last so yeah. it's uh, definitely yeah, worth sure. that time so uh for sure you know and bill uh uh, uh stefan and bill did a good job mixing that record you know and it's kind of funny because I see this coming up on social media from time to time. And they're like, oh, going back through the Less Than Jake stuff, man, that Borders and Boundaries, it's a sleeper. That's one of the best ones. Yeah. You know, like, like, that's a good record, man. That's a good record. Yeah. Well, that makes me excited to, uh, to I've been trying to, trying to listen through all these records in preparation and that one I need to uh, spend some more time with. So I'm excited about that. So we're going to talk uh, just briefly about another uh, band, ska band that you had mentioned before, the Supertones. So this is another example of how you took a band that, you know, didn't really have any previous good recordings before, if I can remember. They just had that one full length that sounded pretty terrible. And you propelled them into something that was just amazing. It has such a better sounding recording and um, just an overall great record. Do you remember if, like, what Tooth and Nails kind of aspirations were with this album or the band? Was it similar to, you know, the life in general experience where they were just kind of ready for that, that uh, big next step? No, I, 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 knew that, I knew that Tooth and Nail, like, had aspirations for the band and I knew that they had laid some groundwork. Um, I will say this also about the OC Supertones is when they came in to make that record, they were incredibly prepared. Like they already knew what the sequence of the record was going to be and posted it on the wall the first day they came oh, into wow. the studio. They're just like, okay, this is the record, these are the songs, and this is the order. And they they worked hard. You know, they were a band I definitely pushed, and we worked to get great tones. We rented some good gear where we had to. You know, we rented a nice drum kit. We got a couple of good guitar amps in. We made the difference. Like we we made the decisions that that took them from the, you know, sounding like a garage band into sounding like a developed band yeah. with properly, properly placed vocals. Yeah. And, and, in, and in a praise band like that, 
you know, vocals in a worship band, vocals are really important. Yeah. Oh, yeah, <laughs> like, definitely. You know, I got a message. Like, you got, got, got to get the message out there, you know? Yeah. Well, and so um, I was actually super grateful to work with, with Super Jones because they were so organized and so prepared and because they had kind of a rounded out idea of, about what kind of a record they wanted to make. And for me, it was more like, just about getting great sounds and sort of judging performances. Hey, let's try that one again. Or, hey, section, horn section, let's try that one again, you know? Yeah. And so we did spend some time and a little money making that record. But um, it also sold like 400,000 copies yeah. and got nominated for a Dove Award. I say, so it definitely paid you, off. You put the work in, man. You put the work in and things pay off. You don't put any work in. You don't develop your ideas. You don't have a developed idea to market to people. Man, they're less interested in it. Right. Who knew? Yeah. Oh, that's awesome. <laughs> who, who, who knew that it took hard work, right? Yeah. Like, you know, oh, well, they're having fun up there. They're playing their instruments. They look like they're having fun. Yeah, really? Come to work one day. See how much fun it is. Yeah. Well, that's, <laughs> it's hard work. It's hard work like any other job. Yeah. And that's why I love, love doing this and hearing all these stories because there's so many that, you know, it's just not on their radar. They just hear the record and, you know, you just put it on. It's like, oh, this is so fun and easy to listen to. So it must have been fun and easy to make. But that's uh, rarely the occasion. No, nope, it certainly is. It certainly is. Yeah. So with uh, the band Bad Religion, which which album of theirs was it that you worked on? I did a bunch of demo stuff for them, actually. Okay. When? What year would uh, that have been? That would have been. Uh, I'm trying to think back now. That would have been the Atlantic years. They had just done. Um. They had just done, uh, what's the Infected record? The first record they did on Atlantic. Uh, oh, man, the discography is so big, I can't uh, think of it in order right now. Uh, anyhow, they had just done the first record for Atlantic, and they were setting up, I believe, for The Grey Race. Oh, okay, that's the one I was going to mention. But... Right, so um, they came into West Beach, and they were like, okay, we want to demo like a bunch of stuff. And so I had the opportunity to work with them like off the floor, and kind of work with the band piecing demos together for this next record. And it was just a terrific experience mm. um, to work with Graf and to work with Baker, work with Bobby Shayer, um, you know, just guys that had, you know, had, 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 had kind of led the way. Right. So had they, you know, Br Brian and minor threat, you know, obviously like working with him, you know, after, the, after that was something else. And, Working with Graf and it was great. Greg was very even and very um, uh, just. He's such a he's such a, a soft spoken and well spoken gentleman. Yeah. Um, and uh, I always felt comfortable around Greg Graf and he's uh, takes time to speak to you. Always acknowledges you. Always remembers you. Always says hello. Mm. Would those be um, guys you still keep in touch with? Uh, I don't keep in touch them with them on a professional, uh, um, in a, in a professional stance, but you know, if I see them at a show or something like that, we'll stop and say hello for sure. Yeah. Well, that's awesome. So had they kind of taken off by that point? Can't oh yeah, what most year definitely. That, what years those were. Yeah, 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 yeah. Like that, that they just done the, in, they had just done that record with, for Atlantic with infected on it. And that was, a, it was a mega smash. The record had gone gold within, I don't know, three months, oh, 90, wow. okay. 90 days or 120 days, uh, that song Infected went gold. Yeah. And it's funny because you even go, you go back and see them live now. And when they play that song, you're like, holy mackerel. When it hits, it hits. That is a hit. Yeah. That was written as a hit. They took their time to, to write it as a hit, you know? Yeah, that's awesome. Yeah, they're definitely a band that still still continues to put out interesting music and they have good things to say. And and uh, it, it's it's you know, a special thing to have a band that can still stay relevant after, well, they've been oh, around for sure. like 30, 40, after 40, 40 years. years. Yeah. It's insane. 40 years, 40 years. Yeah. That's crazy. Yeah, They're still doing it. Well, the last project, um, I just wanted to briefly touch on and, uh, it's mostly just with one guy. So, um, I recently chatted with Ethan Luck, if you remember him from the dingies. Sure. Do. And, uh, he was saying that, that he believes his success to this day is greatly in part to his experience with working with you. And uh, just the way that you really helped him to kind of solidify his musicianship and helped him to um, have the ability to simplify and focus on what the song really needs has been life changing for him. So I just wanted to share that because I thought that was a really, a really cool thing to to hear from another musician that's had such a big impact from you from working with you. Oh yeah, yeah, that's really neat. And uh, actually, he and I got in touch uh, back in touch a couple of years ago via Twitter, <laughs> which I love. 
Yeah, well, because you were on uh, his podcast, right? Talking about the Dingies record, was it? Yep. Yeah, yep, yeah absolutely. That. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and so, yeah, we got back in touch via Twitter. Uh, if anybody's listening and wants to follow me on Twitter, it's Stephen Brad. It's it's S- Stephen Bradley. S T V N underscore Bradley. Um, and uh, yeah, we got back in touch, uh, which was a really nice thing because it and we spoke on his podcast and talked about making that that record, which is I really like oh, the, those man, Disney's so records. Good, yeah, yeah. Uh, I, I I go back and those were ones where it was sort of like. I was a kid in a candy shop and I could kind of do what I wanted and as a producer and let's do this here, let's do that there. And, um, the guys freed me up a lot. Um, and, and they really dropped in line when it came to getting the performances where they needed to be. So those are good sounding, good performed records. Yeah. And it's, I mean, they, they were young and I think they were just willing to, to take advice. And even if it was maybe, you know, I was talking with Ethan about drums, um, cause the, the drums are pretty, are pretty simple on that album. And I remember hearing that, you know, you would always kind of help them focus, like just kind of give the song what it needs. It doesn't need to be so busy, especially, you know, on the, you know, the slower, maybe ska reggae, um, style songs. And, you know, when that record came out, you know, again, as a, as a drummer to me, I was like, man, why, like, why are the drums so simple on here? But, you know, as I progress as a musician and hear some of the backstory to it, it's like, and I can appreciate that so much more now versus, you know, when I was a teenager. Well, it was a ska record, right? So first key is you want to swing and you want to swing hard. Okay. So in order to do that, you kind of got to open the arrangement up a little bit. Yeah, for sure. Um, o- overplaying is not going to help you swing. Yeah. And the other thing is when you're doing those sort of ska influenced records and you're dropping a horn section over over top of them later, you need real estate to do that. Yeah, definitely. And you don't get real estate by having some guy bash on a splash cymbal six times on a chorus. <laughs> no doubt. Yeah, that's you know? yeah, and that's that's what I love hearing again because I wouldn't have understood that obviously as a you know sixteen year old or whatever when that album came out, but. So it's it's so cool getting to you to kind of hear that and appreciate it more when I go yeah, back no, and listen. I, I get, I I get that those some of those arrangements sound super open and almost stark, right? But if you listen to them, they sound super inviting. Yeah, and that's part of that's part of that openness. Yeah, definitely, awesome. Well, the last album I want to touch on is the solo album that you released. Yeah, I put out my my very first <laughs> record. Uh, of my own uh, last fall, actually, it came out just at the end of September, early October. Yeah, so it was. So it's been out, been out a little bit over six months, seven months. And so, what was the inspiration behind that? Why, after all these years? Oh well, that project had actually been on the docket for twenty years. Oh wow! I just hadn't gotten around to working on it because I was too busy making records for other bands. Yeah, crazy. <laughs> so, what, what were your hopes? But yeah, that my hopes for that were just to make a decent record and get it out. You know, to put 10 or 12 songs together that I could listen to and go, wow, you wrote 10 or 12 really good songs. Yeah. And uh, and you put them out there. And that's really the totality of, of that goal. Oh, well, maybe there's a little bit more to that just in the sense of I wanted to start doing some more writing because as I... Um, so I get a little bit older, I feel like writing is something I continue to do, can, can, can continue to do, um, can continue to participate in, and uh, starting to try and write for other people and mm. to do co-writes yeah. and to offer myself up for co-writes right now. You know, I'm, I'm, I'm doing that kind of stuff. And so I thought to myself, well, nobody's going to co-write with you unless you uh, have a bunch of songs that sound okay. <laughs> yeah, well, that's a good place to start. How do you find... So, uh, that is yep. like working on your own album versus producing a band. What's the dynamic like? Is it, you know, do you have someone working with you, you know, doing the actual recording of it while you're recording the parts or is it just you and your studio figuring it all out? That's just me and my studio figuring it all out. And of course that takes time. Um, and it took, it took a while to make that record. Um, but as far as the overall approach, like as, as far as like, producing a record there's no difference at all hmm. um i know the goal i know what i have to do to get to the goal and so i just kind of hunker down and start knocking it out bit by bit yeah 
And do you feel like you have the same motivation when it's your own work versus another band's? Like, is there the same, I mean, like you said, these songs have been around for so long. So obviously, you know, the same pressure isn't there because you don't have the same deadlines and release schedule and all that. But how, how do you kind of motivate yourself to, to finally well, work on I'm, something? I, I'm sure, I'm sure I feel less pressure towards my own stuff as opposed to pressure for somebody that I'm working for. Um, and that's probably a healthy thing because if you're, working on your own songs or your own material. Um, you have to focus on keeping it fresh and not getting too obsessed with it, you know? Yeah, that's true. As, as well. So uh, there, there, there's that part to the, to the equation. Like I was saying, like the, 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 the recording part of it just sort of takes care of itself. You know, well, we do some a scratch guitar and then we do some drums and then we do some more guitar and then we do some vocals and then we do some bass, you know, like that, that path is already defined right? because that's the path I follow every time I make a record. Yeah. Um, but preparing to make the record to sit down and go, okay, now you have to write lyrics for a dozen songs that are your songs, nobody else's songs. Mm. And you've got to come up with arrangements that are your songs, nobody else's songs. Yeah. And then you start thinking about people that have been listening to like these millions of records that you have produced that, that got sold. So there's pressure, but it's a different kind of pressure. And you want to put your best foot forward when you're making your first record and you want to uh, be all you can be. At the same time, you don't want to beat yourself down about it so much that you, it's not fun. Right, yeah. Um, and you also want to hold the torch of the completed project high because you realize that people may be familiar with other stuff you've done over the years. Yeah. And so they have expectations about what it's going to sound like. Yeah. So do you have someone that you kind of pass your songs by just to get a second ear on it? Or do you just kind of trust your instinct on those? No, no, I didn't certainly didn't trust my ear. <laughs> um, for, for songwriting, even before the songs were recorded, I had already, the lyrics came first. I wrote all the lyrics for the songs first, then arranged them to music. Uh, then I took those arrangements of, of just a guitar and a vocal, and I sent them to a couple of different writers that I know who I've had very long relationships with. Uh, we're talking 30 years, you know, yeah, awesome. knowing, people for knowing people for 30, 35 years. And you send them your stuff and you go, okay, this is what I've got. Where are we at? And just don't hold back and let me know. Hmm. And so I put the stuff through that process before I committed to even stepping into the studio and deciding, okay, now it's time to record this stuff. Yeah. Are you the kind of guy that's, that's always writing or do you kind of find yourself writing kind of in seasons just whenever you have time or feel inspired or what does that look no, like for no. you? No, I'm no. I'm, I'm not a Tim Armstrong. Tim can write three songs a day and they're all gems, you know? Um, he, it just happens for him. I can't write like that because my ideas need more time to distillate and, and, and develop. Yeah. No, um, fair. and I feel like, like, I always remember this story that Billy Joe talks about, about the Dookie record. And he's like, I went into, we went in to record that record and we've got a label, we've got the producer, we've got the studio and I don't have a single lyric. Wow. And that's how he started Dookie. Yeah, that just and sounds like too he said, stressful. Yeah, and he said at the end of that, he says, I'm, I told myself you're never, ever going to do that again. Yeah. And he's right, right? Like there's no way. And so this record had been building up for me for a long time. It had been on the docket for a long time. It needed to get done for a long time. So it wasn't like I was going to sit down and scribble some stuff on a cocktail napkin and that was going to be what I had to say right. to the world. Like, <laughs> No. Yeah, lots of so time I to spent, put thought yeah, into that. I, sp I spent two months at my desk writing and writing and writing. Just lyrics, not even music, just lyrics. Until I felt like I was in a place where I could get behind what I'm saying here and I don't feel embarrassed by what I'm saying. Right. And at that point, I took it into the studio and was like, okay, let's grab a guitar and let's figure out what does this lyric sound like? What does this song sound like? And that's how all the songs on the Stephen Bradley record were built. Mm. Yeah, that's really cool to hear. How? What do you find inspires your your lyrics at this at this stage of life? Hmm. A, a good muse. So a, a muse is a, a muse is a 
is something that poets would use back in the old days. Oh, okay. Um, your muse is the one that you write about or the person that inspires your right. writing. Right, yeah, yeah. And so for that record, I had a good muse. Mm. And so that helped a lot as far as focusing the ideas and getting the stories told. Yeah. Um, and I knew right at that time, it was like, okay, you have to write about this stuff right now because everything's makes sense and it's fresh and it'll make sense if you talk, if you write it down now. Right. Yeah. And that, that moment's never coming back. Um, it'll have to be seasonal until something comes again and hits me. Um, I mean, I'm working on other co-writes and other things, but for me to like go, okay, next LP, like that's going to probably be the same process. Yeah. Sitting down and weeding through two months of ideas to get, you know, a dozen songs and then building it from there. Yeah. Well, that's awesome. Because I feel like it, I feel like if I do it in that process, it's so funny. Cause I talked to, I was on the Herrera podcast a little while ago yep. and he yeah, was like, well, tell that. me how these songs, how, how did these songs came together, come together? And I was like, well, I wrote the lyrics first. And he's like, I can't do that. It's like, there's no way I can function like that. And I said, there's kind of no way I can function without working it that way. Like if I don't know what I'm, what my message is, if I, I don't know what it is that I have to say, I don't even know how to start to say it. Yeah, that's a really interesting look on uh, outlook on that. I like that. Yeah, it's a lot. Yeah, probably but, different than most bands. Uh, for sure. Every well, you know, a lot of folks are like, "Oh, hey, we came up with this groove, or we came up with this riff." Okay, try and stick something to that. I'd much rather try and create a mood with with poetry and lyric, and then go, "Okay, let's match um, a musical mood to this lyric." Yeah, I think that that I think there's more. I think there might be a little bit more power or a little bit more. Uh, um, possibility right there if that makes sense yeah yeah no that's that's great to hear about that and yeah it's, it's been so so cool just hearing your insight and thoughts on all these different projects and you know we're just kind of touching the surface and there's lots of other other albums you've worked on yeah and... no i'm I, like yeah for sure i'm super happy about how my record came out i'm stoked about the guys that played on it johnny from Social D and, you know, Wayne from MC5, Kevin Kane from Grapes of Wrath and Northern Pikes. Um, you know, there's a lot of folks that got involved that jumped in to play on the record that are really, really um, well-versed, great songwriters and great artists in their own right. Yeah. And I'm so blessed to have them as part of the record and so blessed, so blessed that all of that came together and I was able to get it out and that folks have given it a chance, you know. Yeah. And so that's uh, so that's been a real positive of the last... You know, you know, as well from a writer, but like also from a production standpoint, yep. you know, the record sounds good and it's getting some radio play. And I listened to these guys over in uh, Scotland, I think it was today, who were playing it on their podcast. Oh, and that's awesome. They're, and they're talking about like the pro the production's great. That's great. <laughs> so the record, this record sounds great, man. And so it's nice to hear hear that as well. It's like, hey, we like the songs, but we like how the record sounds too. So I don't know. Maybe after thirty years, I've learned something. Yeah. So if people want to to find this record, where can they find it? And you mentioned Twitter before. The, where else can people yeah, find yeah, you? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think the easy. I think the easiest place if people want to check out my record label or check out my record is just go to PorterHouseRecords.com. Porterhouse like the steak. Drop by PorterHouseRecords.com. See some of the vinyl reissues that I do there. Check out my record. Um, check out this new, new germs reissue that I have coming out, uh, on my label, all sorts of good stuff's always happening over there. And it's always kind of geared towards some of the old school punk rock. And I write a lot of copy at the website so people can see, you know, my thoughts on those old releases and the stuff that we do, yeah, you know, right on. Awesome. Well, Steve, it's been an absolute pleasure getting to, to pick your brain on, on many of my favorite albums and many of other people's favorite albums. And so thanks so much for, for taking the time to share your wisdom and knowledge and, and stories with us today. No problem. I had a great time talking with you. Awesome. Thanks so much, Steve. Right on. Did you have to take that Cooter preference test when you were a senior in high school? Oh, yeah, I took it. They said I should be a fire watcher. <laughs> what are you supposed to be? An underachiever.